Welcome to Showing Up Solo, your go-to source for solopreneur success in the digital world. You're not just running a business, you're wearing all the hats, from CEO to content creator. What if I told you there's a way to master online marketing without sacrificing all your time? Hi everyone and welcome to this final episode of Showing Up Solo for the year. Today we've got a really great topic. We're talking about money and how to set your prices for your services. And I'm really thrilled to be joined by two incredible women and business owners today. We've got Maxine Cunningham, creator of Pick My Brain, and Hannah Duncan, who you might remember, she's been a guest on the show before. Of, of Hannah Duncan Investment Content, freelance copywriter. And uh, we're going to talk all about money and how to really determine your value and charge what you're worth. Uh, so before we dive in, I'm going to hand it off to each of you to just introduce yourself a little bit more thoroughly. Maxine, because you're new here, let's start with you. Sure. So nice to be here. Uh, my name is Maxine. I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Pick My Brain. Uh, Pick My Brain is a platform that helps people from all around the world package price and gift their knowledge in new and creative ways. Um, we have 10,000 people currently on the platform from 88 countries and have transacted about $2 million worth of knowledge services through our platform over the last three years. Um, I've helped about 1,000 people package and price their knowledge, uh, everything from free 30-minute sessions to paid Pick My Brain calls to paid coffee and conversations to coaching, consulting, and uh, mentoring and beyond. So really have a wide variety of packaging and pricing across borders, which is also interesting. Um, and we are on a mission. Google was on a mission to make the world's information more available, accessible, and useful to society. Uh, but Pick My Brain's mission is to make the world's people more open, available, and accessible to society. And the way that we do that is by sharing knowledge. So excited. Love that. I love that. I've got a Pick My Brain profile myself. And when I heard about it, I, I mean, it was one of the, uh, as soon as I heard about it, I was like, I have to get in on this because it's such a brilliant idea. Um, I think you've really identified an amazing gap in the marketplace. And I think what you're doing is incredible. Uh, and then Hannah, you, uh, I'm so glad to have you here because I still go back to a piece of pricing advice that you gave me right when my business was a little tiny baby and I was just starting out. And um, I still go back to that, which I will save for further into the episode. Uh, for now, do you want to just reintroduce yourself to my audience, let them know who you are and, and what you do? Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I am British. Um, I'm a freelance writer, but I didn't used to be. I used to work in a bank. And um, probably like a lot of people, I just got bored with the like office politics and having a boss and pointless meetings that should have been emails. So four and a half years ago, I decided to become a full time freelance writer. And I'm still alive. I'm still doing it. I survived. Um, I have about Last time I checked, I think it was 93 clients. Um, and I've written for all kinds of publications. I write about like four articles a week. Um, that's me. Amazing. And you've won awards for your writing. I see um, them all the time oh, on wow. LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. I've won a couple of awards. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, to, I'm sorry. I'm, I have a weird sense of pride with you, Hannah, even though I've had zero input in your career. <laughs> but because I know you from high school, I remember when you were not even a teenager yet. And, and so I always, um, I love to see you succeed. I think it's incredible. Well, you um, were my first mentor, actually. So when um, I was 11, and I went to a new school and I got instantly just like scooped up by Hannah, who was a few years older than me. I think actually you were in the year that was leaving and I was in the year that was joining. So Maybe, there was like yeah. quite a difference. Yeah. And straight away, I was just like scooped up, dressed the same, looked the same, felt very cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was mini Hannah. <laughs> I was like, I like you. You're my mini me from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you so much, um, ladies, for joining me today. I, I think this is a topic that um, it's a stumbling block for a lot of entrepreneurs. And I think it's safe to say it's a stumbling block for a lot of people who've been socialized as women. Mm -hmm. um, I know that generally um, 
Well, I just, I know from my experience working in corporate, like working, um, I worked on reception and office services for a while. And I know that a lot of my knowledge was just taken for granted, even mm -hmm. though I knew like the bosses could not do what I did on a daily basis. If, um, the, mm -hmm. the tech knowledge I had to have, the organizational knowledge I had to have, they would not have been able to do it themselves. They did not have that skill set. But I was at the bottom of the, the food chain, as you were. So it wasn't valued as such. And it took a huge mindset shift going into business for myself mm -hmm. to start charging for this knowledge that I'd always taken for granted and um, never valued fully. Like I started off as a virtual assistant. So doing what I had been doing before. And it, mm. I kept thinking about, well, this is what I used to get paid hourly. So this is what I should be paid versus like what I was actually providing my clients. So I would love to know, um, where do you, where did you start? How did you figure out what to charge people <laughs> or what, what kind of got in, what were your first sort of mindset hurdles to get over when mm. you were first figuring out how am I going to make money doing this? How am I going to charge for this? Yeah, I can jump in first. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So prior to becoming a startup founder, um, I was a, a, an economist and I, I was, I was a little bit unhappy with my job, but as I was moving into this idea of building pick my brain, I, uh, and this idea of allowing people to package price and gift knowledge and that, you know, can, would someone pay me for knowledge? Would people buy knowledge? Because people are very good at buying things that they can touch, but when it comes to things they can't touch, um, much harder to value and be confident in that value. And so I was like, okay, well, I've got this concept. I think it's really powerful, but I have to go validate it. And the way I validated my very first offering and how I priced it was actually, um, just a coffee and a conversation with a startup founder. That was my very first offer to test this concept. And I actually listed it on Airbnb's experience marketplace to get the exposure because I didn't yet have a platform. And again, I was just validating. So I, I packaged it something that I wanted to offer, which was like, I wonder if people will pay to have a coffee with someone that is not famous because that was my validation. And so I put, yeah, coffee and conversation with a Vancouver startup founder. Um, the description of the offer was anyone who's interested in talking about the future of work, the future of education, or has an idea or wants to learn more about startup life, book me here. And I charged uh, 50, 50 US dollars uh, for a 45 minute. We'd meet at my coffee shop. And again, I was just like, I wonder if anybody wants to, you know, pay and have a coffee with me. And this was my validation. And um, I put it at that price because I thought it was, it was, a, it was enough. It was enough to test. That was like my, really my only thing. So I listed this offer. Okay. Let's going to, let's see what's going to happen. Um, to my surprise, 60 people from around the world booked and paid me for a coffee and conversation within three months and wow. I'm going for coffee and conversations like every other day. And I was like, no way. Like I, I can't even believe this. And this wasn't the only insight. So not only, yes, I made $3,000 from that one test. But I made so much more because of it. Um, and I'll speak to that, but I had, it was because this offer attracted my exact ideal customer persona, which was someone who wanted to engage in that discussion, show up with intent and have a meaningful conversation. And so those 60 people, like every single one of those experiences was 10 out of 10 because they were formally booking me for that and coming ready to do that. They all showed up on time. We had a coffee. It was, and I didn't feel depleted at the end because there was a compensation and there was that formalization, but what made me go all in and, and quit everything and go hundred percent and pick my brain is what those conversations actually turned into. And the first three are just enough. I have 65 other stories that, that I could speak to, but the very first person that booked me ended up becoming my first employee three years later. The second person that booked me ended up writing my first $50,000 check when I started raising. And the third person that booked me, I actually ended up falling in love with. And oh. I was like, <laughs> wild, this return is crazy. <laughs> and then I had these other, you know, 50 plus people that um, by the time we had engaged in this meaningful conversation, we were intimately connected. They were inviting me to visit them in their country. Um, they were the first users of Pick My Brain. Um, they got my network out into other countries. And I was like, wow, the return on investment on that $50 offer 
um, was profound. Like I, I didn't even know how to, as an economist, I was trying to measure it. Yes. I've got the $3,000 of monetary value, but then all of this compounding value that is still returning me money was coming back. And that's when I was like, I need to understand, this is the value-based pricing a little bit more, but also recognizing, like, I think the industry talked a lot about, oh, like one-on-one is not worth your time. It's not scalable. And I'm like, nope, the compounding uh, indicator on a one-on-one time is infinitely compounding like over years. So it's actually not, I think they've got the equation wrong, but that first offer gave me confidence that if I am intentional and conscious about my offer and I go into my inside and be like, what do I want to attract? Like that gave me the power to attract <clears throat> these 60 people into my life. Um, very intentionally. And so that going forward, got me confident about how to package other things and I started playing and giving, giving myself, yeah, total freedom to get creative about how to do that. And I've since then, you know, packaged a, a bunch of services just to play with the market. And every time I am surprised at how, if you are just so intentional about calling in what you want, it can, it, it finds its way to you. So that was my very first offer. <laughs> yeah, wow. wow. That's amazing. It's so cool how it's so cool how it can be like passive income to you like after a yeah. while yeah as like a freelance writer that's just something that's unless I were to write like a book or something right which I have done but for other people <laughs> and <laughs> unless you unless I was to write something that could keep selling itself forever I could like never ever achieve passive income I think like I think that's the dream I don't really have the answer for that um, for me, when I started, I just looked at how much. Oh, do you have an idea, Maxine? <laughs> I do. I Maxine's like, yeah, well, I, I, I know do, what you sure. Can you tell me? <laughs> Can you tell yeah. me? I, I, well, the way, I, well, I want to learn more about your service. Maybe tell me about your first package, but I do have an idea for you, but I'll, I'll save it, but I'll, I'll share you. I'll share it with oh you. Oh my but... God. I think your idea is going to be better than my story there. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Sure. We've got time for both. And I'm sure our listeners want to hear both. So, okay. Yeah. Um, so when I first started, then I just looked at uh, what the agencies were charging. So a lot of freelance writers will know that there's content agencies out there and they charge like quite a lot of money. So mm-hmm. on average, I, I write about finance, right? And on average, the content agencies were charging about a thousand pounds for an article. Wow. Uh, the articles, like, I don't want to be rude, but they weren't always that great. And they didn't really follow like the some of the rules you need to follow when you write about finance for consumers and um, they didn't have great SEO and like a lot of them I don't think they'd really studied finance so they were charging about a thousand pounds for articles that I felt were missing something so when I first started I charged 350 pounds for an article um, and I felt that that had to be compelling and it had to be compelling for agencies to outsource to me but also for um, banks and fintechs as well and then over time I sort of built it up and now it's 550 pounds an article as I've got more experience and as I'm more known and like you said like with each award I give myself a little pay rise about 50 pounds more um, per article but my original clients the ones who stayed with me for four and a half years they get the price of when they took me on does that make sense so like I write for oh actually I've got a magazine here it's a mouse pad I write for like this company a lot called Syntax Finance and they still get my like very original price. But every time you took me on, as long as you don't break the retainer, then that's the price I stick with. Because I would a million times rather have a retainer than not have a retainer because cash flow is really hard for freelancers. Yeah. So what I guess I'd say is just look at when you when you do a competitor analysis, don't necessarily compare yourself to other freelancers out there compare yourself to agencies and the cost of employees and try and just make sure that you're delivering better quality for half or even a third of the price when you start and just build it up from there. So I know Maxine, you've got something on the tip of your tongue, but I just want to say, so I love, I can totally see the finance background of both you ladies, the approaches you've both taken very um, from a, a economical financial, like marketplace based perspective and it's just interesting because my approach to pricing is is almost completely different I um Mm. at first I started with this I was in the employee mindset of okay I want to make $25 an hour you know that's that's what I want to make and then $30 an hour and 
started thinking very much in terms of hourly. And, um, and then I learned to charge for deliverables. I, I did a course by Chantel Davison, um, mm-hmm. which is all about helping you become a, a, get paid for writing, basically, get, become a copywriter. And it was very much like charge for deliverables versus for the amount of time. And I was mm-hmm. learning that. The better I got at my work, the quicker it took me. So the less money I made if I was charging hourly. So mm-hmm. I started basing my prices on how much time I thought the longest amount of time I thought it would take me. Like if I thought it at the most, it would take me three hours and I would charge this much. And if it only took me 30 minutes bonus, I've made more money than I would have. Mm -hmm. But more and more, I now charge what I want to be paid. (laughs) Like I I started off doing like little strategy calls because I found a lot of people wanted to pick my brain too. So I started Mm -hmm. thinking, oh, I should just charge for these. I'll just charge $25 for an hour. (laughs) <laughs> I now charge $250 to talk mm. to me for an hour Yeah, because I'm like, I don't hold back. Like you ask me a question and there's no limitations on the knowledge I'll share. Like I will just, the floodgates are open and you'll get mm-hmm. every piece of <laughs> insight I can give you for your hour. Mm-hmm. And what amazes me is that people will pay that. I actually had an incident where a previous employer paid me $600 for I think two or three hours of my time, someone who I wouldn't have made that in a week <laughs> with them. Was that weird? Like, that was, that that was a bit of a, and... a mind blowing thing. And I and... think that should be normal. As a company, <laughs> that's actually the smartest. Yeah. I'm like, that's not enough because if an employee leaves, they have ultimate resources. I think when an employee leaves, companies should put them on a directory and give them a price and like support anyone that's worked at the organization so that anyone that new is coming in, here are all the people that know everything. You're new. Here's their rates. Here's like side gig, you know, here's a, a list of people that you can contact to learn on the job instead of this training. So I actually think that's an excellent transfer of knowledge and value and should be something that's repeated because so many people leave. Like I'm trying to talk to IBM. Um, again, they have an alumni network of hundreds of thousands of people that when they retire, they're just done. I'm like, why don't you build a directory for these individuals? And if the company ever needs to bring them in for a day, book them for 2,500 bucks, bring them in for a day, get this guy to transfer his knowledge more, or this girl to transfer their knowledge more, or bring them in for workshops or day consultants rates. Cause they have 20 plus years of experience. You cannot, and then give them an opportunity to be like, yes, you're leaving IBM or this insert company, but we're going to put you on a roster that you're going to be available per day at 2,500 bucks a day. Would you be interested in doing a few of those? You know, I bet you, again, the value is like, great. The employee still feels connected to the company, which is great for the company and the employee. The employee has a directory of resources, which hundreds of years of experience is deep, which can do training. Um, When they hire any external consultant, they should go to this directory because these people have the values and culture already embedded, which takes all of the work, Um, you know, but we're missing that link. We just like, let those employees like filter away. Yeah. And that transfer of knowledge does not happen. So I love that you got that. I think that should be cultural norm. Um, Maxine, did you think of that right now? I've been, I've been pondering with, I just, I, one of our advisors sits on IBM and he told me about that he is a retiree Mm -hmm. and I'm like, do they, why wouldn't they draw on your knowledge? Why didn't they, why wouldn't they exclusively consult with people that worked at this company? And so I've been pitching it to him and workshopping it, Um, but it's now just triggered to me like, no, it is a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. (laughs) And you're so good at ideas. (laughs) (laughs) I just pick brain. <laughs> this makes you want to pick her brain. <laughs> but I, I do. I think that's like that's a way to see it, isn't it? Like because yeah. they wouldn't have when I was working for them, they wouldn't have thought twice about asking for that same level of knowledge and input, and it would have just been part of. Yeah. Like I actually, um, I I'm neurodivergent, so as someone who's neurodivergent, when I learn something, like it becomes. I, I kept asking for more work because once I learn how to do something, like I know how to do it, yeah. and then I get bored and I want more. And yeah. I started off as a receptionist at, at one of my previous places of employment. I started off as a receptionist and then I absorbed being in charge of the health and safety newsletter. And I started writing a, new, a monthly newsletter for the, the company. And then I absorbed somehow that became, I absorbed the intranet, the company intranet. And I became responsible for updating the content on the company intranet. And then I absorbed being head of the social, like I wasn't head officially head of the socials 
committee, the fundraising, but I became in charge of doing all the fundraising and everything. Mm -hmm. And then I would go on maternity leave and they'd be like, so like, what do people need to do? Like your reception, right? And I'm like, yeah, but I also do this, this. Like, I remember having several meetings before my second mat leave, especially Mm -hmm. with the IT department. And they're going, so who does this now? And I'm like, I do. So one of you has to do this now because Mm -hmm. no one else knows how to do it in my department, Mm -hmm. you know, um, who manages the legal library. I do. So someone else has to learn how to do that. And it was just um, like, and it, all of this information, like you have to replace me with two or three different people mm-hmm. to do that. And it, I, so I think that would be a very useful knowledge. Yeah. I'll keep doing this on a fractional basis for this much retainer. Like Hannah said, put me on a retainer and I'll cover for the next three to six months as you make this transition. Yeah. yeah, like we're oh, missing so, so much for the value. cost of living. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, Maxine, I know that you have like a little insight that you wanted to share with Hannah. Uh, a big idea. Well, Are you going to change my life? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I, and I would have to understand your client persona, but what I've tried to do with clients, like you're a freelance writer. So every client, if I was you, that I sit down and like am consulting for or providing services to, I would know all of the things, all of the products that a writer could provide a client, which is like an article, which is LinkedIn ghostwriting, which is a book, which is, you know, there, what are all the things, what are all the writing tools that you most love to write for someone? That person, I would try again, over the course of our relationship, if I had that client, I try to get them, I would inspire them to add more and more content versus just an article. So I'd almost like work with my client and be like, I think you're ready for a book, or I think you're ready for 10 LinkedIn articles, or I think you're ready to take um, this article series and package it in this way. And so instead of just like having, uh, I find like people service someone and then they're done. I'm like, no, that one person you can in your repertoire be like, I've written books for people. I've written da, 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 da. And, and yeah. uh, trying to always like, um, get them on to the next product of inspiration that they can put into um, that form of content. Yeah. Yeah. I do try to do a little bit of that at the moment, um, but it's not passive. It's still not as good as your business model because every, like every article okay. I write takes like two days and then I write yeah. it and I get paid for it and then it's done. And it's done. Whereas like with more of a value-based model, you yeah. do it yeah. and then it keeps going forever and then you keep earning from it forever and I have another friend she's so cool she's called Maria and she does um tarot cards yeah and she does all the work once designs them makes them beautiful and then just like they sort of sell themselves yeah and I see her business model and I'm like oh you're gonna like you're gonna be living the life when you're a grandma you know (laughs) whereas like me I'll still be doing like article by article by article so that's like the downside of freelance writing is you it is you do so much work for one chunk of money and then that's the end of it unless you hire other writers and build your own marketplace of writers and then have yeah Yeah. that's really interesting because I actually I I came up with that when I first started my business I started getting like a lot of clients I got a lot of referrals people coming in wanting when I pivoted to social media management and offering copywriting services and everyone told me okay now to scale you're going to need to hire contractors and I ended up hiring a bunch of contractors and ended up making less money like my revenue went up but my money went down because I was paying it out to contractors. I was only taking a percentage of what they were doing, but I was still spending a lot of time like managing the client relationships mm-hmm. and everything. Were you happy with the work? Hmm? Were I was, you happy with the no, work? No, because I ended up, well, as a dyslexic person, I ended up reading instead of writing. Like most of my work was editing everybody. So I, I stopped doing the part that I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And, and it just didn't work. The demand on my time didn't work with, with me being a mom of two kids. Mm-hmm. One of them wasn't yet in actually, but at that, I think at the point, neither of them were in school yet. They were in preschool. So they're only in for like three hours a day. Like I think I had three hours of time to work on my business. So I ended up breaking everything down, dumping most of my clients, again, in the nicest way, but like leave, parting ways with most of my clients and trying to reformat a business that I could do with a 15 hour work week, but still earn a full-time income. And so my motto since then has been, what can I do? do that'll make me the most amount of money in the least amount of time that I still enjoy doing so like for example Mm -hmm. copywriting 
I make more money for copywriting than I do for say social media management mm -hmm. because social media management is like posting, scheduling, engaging on the platform. There's a lot of, I have to be like butt in seat in front of a computer or a phone doing on an mm -hmm. hourly basis. And people mm -hmm. don't like to pay a lot of money for hourly work. They just, mm -hmm. they don't. Mm -hmm. Whereas a blog, I say it's this much, whether it took me five minutes or five mm -hmm. hours or mm -hmm. five days. And if I felt like it, I could outsource it. Um, and I would make as much money off of it, but at least I knew it could be done, but I would just be like, it's this much, this is how much it is. Um, I also have started doing like a lot of batching with my clients. So I have clients where, um, one client, we, we did a, basically they purchased 12 blog posts and all the, uh, accompanying LinkedIn captions to promote those. And so I delivered it in chunks of four, like here's four months worth of content at a time around, mm -hmm. based around the school holidays, actually. Mm -hmm. And, but they just paid me. Um, they would just divide. Those it. are the best ones. They're yeah. like four a month. Those are the, when someone orders, like the most I ever got was 40 articles in one go. Uh -huh. And it's yeah. like heaven. Cause we're like, oh my God, like I'm definitely going to be able to pay my mortgage for three months. Yeah. <laughs> and it just feels like, Great. You know, yeah, because you, you have like, a guaranteed oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> income going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. I would always prefer to have like, someone divide a big fee across several months if I know that they're going to pay, if I trust that they're they're going to be there. Um, but yeah, like that's one of the things. Sorry, Maxine. <laughs> no, no, no. I interrupted. You go finish that thought and I'll jump I was just in. Gonna, So that's why like, I've been pivoting towards doing a lot of coaching now too, because mm -hmm. one of the pieces of feedback I got consistently from mm -hmm. all of my clients was that they love our monthly calls. I always offered it as just like a standard because I like to get on a call with a client to like plan. And they always said, like, I miss our calls. I want our monthly calls. That's what I want to keep. And so I started, okay, well then this is what I need to charge for. And so, I mean, there's growing pains pivoting towards that knowledge based business <laughs> format. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of people just want the work. Like they don't yeah. want to touch it. They want it done for them, yeah. but mm -hmm. some, if you like, if you think about it in terms of hiring someone who um, doesn't have that strategic mindset about it, mm -hmm. you're going to pay them more in terms of total hours spent than you would to pay me to give you the direct instructions and then have maybe one of my trained contractors deliver it for you. So I know that was just mm -hmm. my, um, like my, my motto for the year has been work less, earn mm -hmm. more, least mm -hmm. amount of time, most amount of money been like my approach this year that is easy journey. to say difficult to do it is i was like yeah, yeah. that's cool <laughs> are you ready to take your offers and audience engagement to the next level i'm thrilled to introduce you to a game-changing resource plan your purchase paths this comprehensive digital guide is your introduction to the world of sales funnels whether you're launching a new offer or aiming to supercharge an existing one, understanding purchase paths is your secret sauce to achieving meaningful results. From mapping out your customer journey to preparing leads for purchase, this guide will be your trusted companion, guiding you towards sales funnel success. Get ready to empower your business with strategic purchase paths that lead your audience to conversion. Head to showingofsolo.com forward slash free to grab your copy. Um, a comment on like as freelancers and, and what Hannah uh, expressing like, oh, it's so nice to get 400 articles up front. Cause I know I can pay my mortgage for three months and I can like time, I can time manage better as well when you have that, right. Cause you have a task, you have a number, you have your revenue. That's great as a freelancer. So start packaging your services that way. I've done this before as well. And I do this as a, I, I bought real estate uh, to put myself through university and I learned this skill renting out these houses and this is another passive income so going outside of your like um services is another great way to diversify your revenue streams so i've got like my stock market revenue i've got my bitcoin black crypto revenue and i've got my real estate and then i've got pick my brain but what i learned with the real estate was that as a as someone who is buying a house and needing the more the income the rental income to over to be over and above the, the mortgage um, and knowing that the transaction cost of losing a tenant is very high, same as a client. When I was young, I would structure the agreement and say, listen, um, if you move into this house, this is the price per month um, for a year long lease. If you decide to 
sign a two-year lease, I'm going to decrease that rent, even though rent is going to increase over the course of two years in this area. Um, if you sign a three-year lease, this is going to be the rent. And I would just know um, what I, my margins that I could work with. As long as the mortgage is being covered, I'm happy. And the longer the tenant I can get in there, the better for me, because that's less work. So I took that same principle and it worked. Like I got someone in there for five years and I negotiated a great deal because I was like, great, five years of someone else buying this house for me is way better than even considering that someone might move out. I um, mean, I have to do all this transaction cost. So I reduced the rent. She had a great rental rate for five years. It's kind of like betting on the interest rate, whether to take flexible or go and fix and, and lock in. And I realized like the stress release that that gave me and the passive income, like I can, I can forget that project now. And so bringing that back to services, if I do Hannah too, like if you love that 400 deal, every client, listen, we could do 10 articles at this price, or you can buy 40 up front um, and pay me today um, a fixed fee of this uh, for 400 and it like, you can find the value that your client, like you still got to hold your rates, but you just got to convey that if they pay up front and I usually will reduce, sometimes I do that with coaching clients too. I'm like, if you want three months of coaching, if you pay me all right. And lots of service providers do that. If you pay that up front, this is the fee. If you pay that monthly, this is the fee. If you pay at the end, this is the fee. And so again, guiding clients, like, cause cash flow is king for freelancers. We really have to learn how to bring our cash flow Like um, yeah, make sure our bases are covered, but I do find clients are willing to negotiate. If you know the right client, you know what their situation is. FinTech companies have cash flow; They're fine. Or finance companies have the revenue coming in. Would they be willing to, how many other clients could buy 400 or 40 articles up front for this fee that still allows you again to figure out, you know, cause as you do those 40 for that one, that one company, you're going to get more efficient with that one company. Um, versus like onboarding a new company, there's costs, offboarding, there's costs. So can we always up, up front, try our best to make our models uh, more conducive to getting the cash up front? Um, yeah, is- I think um, I do that with 10 articles. So if you buy more than 10, then I, I reduce the rate. Um, and I found that really successful, to be really successful. But like, Hannah, you work with fintechs too, right? Do you think that they, I don't think that they we have enough money to buy like 40 because that like too much in my experience like fintechs and it's only like the really big banks that can afford to pay for 40 and the smaller companies they just like yeah. they'll haggle with you for like two yeah. <laughs> like yeah it's amazing to me the hag- especially these days because there's so much pressure on fintechs from venture capitalists they yeah. want a discount on like literally just one article or well, hannah have you found that well, I don't, I don't work with fintechs. I work, but most of my clients are, are just like me. They're solopreneurs they're or they're small business yeah. owners. Yeah. Um, most of the time, the reason they're outsourcing is they don't have the capacity to have someone full-time handle their marketing and yeah. everything. Oh, and so I do want to be accommodating of people's rates. That's why I try to come up with like, but I'm, I'm very much a, like, let's do the least amount of work to get you the biggest bang for your buck. Like my whole approach to content creation is we create one long form and then we see how like, well, let's repurpose the hell out of it. So you Mm -hmm. squeeze out every drop of use Mm -hmm. for that investment so that um, like, and it's hard to like not want to reduce your rates because you feel like you've really connected with your client and you want them to be able to afford it. But I always try like, yeah, I always try to like, okay, well, here's an offer. Like here's a solution. Um, Like I'll give you, I had a client who um, she needed to set up an email marketing funnel. And so she ended up buying um, some email scripts for me. I have some like done for you scripts. You just pick the one you like. Like there's like options for every level, like every email in the sequence. You pick the one you like, you plug in your info, right? And then she had a coaching call with me. So she she told me she spent two hours working on those scripts to write the draft. And then we spent maybe 30 minutes to an hour tweaking it and making it like at the level where I would be happy with that if I was delivering that as a copywriter. Mm-hmm. And actually she, she told me like, oh, I felt a little bit like, why did I pay all that money if you were going to like tear it apart and everything? Mm-hmm. And I said, but you did the first draft for me and this cost you the, the coaching session. And then the fifth, like, I think it cost you like $300 to get this done. If you had paid me to do this for you, it would have cost you closer to $3,000 mm-hmm. to do it from scratch. Mm-hmm. So you've saved a huge mm-hmm. amount of money by doing some of the work yourself Mm-hmm. And you've still got like basically the same level of quality 
Um, and so that's where I try to come in is I try to say, okay, well, what can you, what can we do to reduce this price? Like, how can I help you mm-hmm. do like, cause I know that, um, and this comes to, like to Maxine, the knowledge broker, like a lot of my clients, they know, like no one knows more about their business and what they do than they do. Mm-hmm. They just don't mm-hmm. have the, maybe the, the skills or the confidence to express that in an effective marketing yeah. format. So I get them to like, let's get the first draft out of you. Here's mm-hmm. some tools to help you do that. Then mm-hmm. I'll refine it with my strategic marketing lens. And, and it's like having an expert by your side versus having to just have someone do it completely for you. Yeah. And, and often I find that the message resonates a lot more with them. They feel um, mm-hmm. more pride in what they've accomplished. Like it feels like they feel more connected with what co collaborated it with you. Exactly. Exactly. So that's how I try to reduce, like not reduce my, like try to meet them in the middle in terms of investment Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and like, so I'm still making the money I want to make. Like if I do that call, yes. I mean, it would be nice to have the the $3,000 contract, but at the same time, I only have to spend an hour instead of X many hours. So Mm -hmm. I still made more mm-hmm. money per, like in, yeah. in that hour than I would have, or I made the same amount and I can book up my, the rest of my time doing other things. So that's how I try to. Yeah. Work. And you get it back in the future as well. Like I find that too. Sometimes people can't afford me, but they do really want to have blogs and I like their business and I like their product. So like, I don't charge or anything. I just tell them like, um, how, like how I think they should write. And I just say, don't worry if you make, if you like grammar mistakes or whatever, just be like authentic and and just explain what you're an expert in. And mm-hmm. like sometimes people um, write a blog and they'll send it to me, I'll have a quick read and it's only like 15 minutes of my time. But mm-hmm. then in like two years, actually their business takes off and they have money and then they think of me because I helped them when they didn't have money. So um, I actually find that quite often if you just do a little, like not yeah. a lot, like just 10 or 15 minutes, Yep. for companies you like then weirdly you get paid like even though you never set out to be paid 100 so. percent. we found the same this is why at pick my brain we ask everyone to gift 10 hours a year and we um advise them like uh, i'll refer to a case study we, we advise them to launch this gifted offer on linkedin and invite people in because it stands out and human reciprocity is if someone gifts me i gotta come back and make it even it's just like kind of how we feel as as humans which is such a good thing to know and so one of our brains valdez he's been booked like 400 times in a couple months and the reason is because so his whole frame is he's, he, he struggled with mental health as he was scaling his startup and like startups struggle with mental health. Cause it's such a solo journey, but anyways, on LinkedIn once a week, he does this post and he says, dear community. And he shares his story very authentically. You know, I took myself to the line too many times and I was on the edge of like, you know, making some bad decisions for my mental health. Um, if there is any other startup founder out there that has struggled with mental health, wants to talk to mental health, needs someone outside of their, their world to talk about mental health, because it's a very scary thing to share with your investors or your team. Give me a call. I offer 10 free sessions every month for founders in this category. And the world responds, you know, again, he always books out those 30 minute calls and not only is he, and then you go and read these reviews. So pick my brain will automatically follow up with anyone that books you and says, how is your session with the Valdez? These reviews from these founders who he has impacted, um, indefinitely just for 30 minutes to like, be able to get off your chest, like how you're feeling about something and have someone validate that that's completely normal. Um, has been so empowering and again, has allowed him now to launch his newsletter, which is this paid subscription, um, has allowed founders to come and now he's starting to monetize like founder group chats because he's realized he's had enough conversations with founders about this. That he's market validated this idea. And on LinkedIn, this post just gets so much engagement because they're like, wow, this is such a beautiful offering. Um, so I always encourage my brains and my clients think of a gift that you so like that you would just be so open to putting out there and turn it into a LinkedIn strategy um, and turn it into an invitation. And it does come back. You just have to be an abundant mindset that, 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 that knows that like, again, I've had so many calls, 30 minute calls that have turned into things that I wouldn't even have expected. Like the investment, this guy writing me this 50,000 investment check after we just had a conversation, like looping back and be like, are you raising? I'd be like, Oh, I wasn't even looking for that. 
um, you know, or calls like I just got back from a trip from Pakistan because someone booked to pick my brain call with me. And that conversation, he made a pitch. He's like, why don't you come to Pakistan and try to launch the knowledge economy in a developing country? And I was like, whoa, didn't even have that in my mind. And I find these gifted offers um, open the door for things that I can't even um, articulate. So for both like um, financial services, um, have you been thinking about writing a series of articles, um, have no idea where to do or want to know what other companies are doing? Um, you know, book a 30 minute call and let's chat about it. Let's strategize about which 10 articles you should um, l- write. And I, I do that on mine. I'm like, book a 30 minute call and let's talk about all of the revenue streams you could create. And in that 30 minutes, if I do a really good job at understanding the person that's coming to me and giving them an idea of how to unlock a new revenue stream or test it, then they book. I'm like, you can now go take that information and, and use it because I feel good about offering that because that's my mission. But if you want my help defining it, I have my next package. And I find, yeah, 30 to 50% conversion on my gifted offers if I am good at, at doing it. And so can you actually invite the industry to come to you to brainstorm with you that you are guiding? Um, it's just mm-hmm. a whole, it's a kind of a different feeling I felt. Um, and, and that reciprocity again, on I think it's, it's time and we're stepping into this economy that is becoming a little bit more um, giving <laughs> yeah. uh, and matching that. So so yeah, it's it's I think I think it's a, a unique strategy to kind of pull revenue as well and gifting and feel good and um, build in that non-linear growth that we're not even thinking yeah. about. I I think. I could, def- oh, sorry, Hannah. I was, no, go on, Hannah. I was just gonna say I think I think we could go on and on about this for hours because it's just such a fascinating topic. But I do want to just be conscious of our listeners' time. So before we wrap things up, I would love for each of you to just give like your one best piece of advice for the, my audience who are listening for solopreneurs who are trying to figure out what to charge. Like how do you determine your value and then charge what you're worth? Um, I would say you're worth a little bit more than you think. Um, I know that's not the advice I gave you, Hannah, but, um, I no, it was, it was very, it was very, it was, it, it was very close. Um, I was, I was, really? The advice you gave me, and I will give, that's my number one takeaway. It's one I still give people, which is what you said to me when, when I was first starting out. Find what you do the easy, find what, whatever you do that's easiest for you and charge the most, charge the most for what you find easiest. And that. Yeah. So yeah. In the, in the context at that time, in my head, somehow you're writing for bankers because to me, everyone's a banker, but I guess you went, but in my head, I was imagining you were saying like, oh, I don't know if I can charge for social media posts. And I was like, are you serious? Like, have you seen them? They can't even send a WhatsApp, you know, like these are people who don't have like Uber, like th- them, like doing an Instagram post is like speaking a different language in a different planet, like charge mm-hmm. them because they're bankers and they you think they spend more than 20 minutes on your product but they charge you a lot because that's their language so when you're speaking your language charge them like charge them the same way they charge you and if it comes naturally to you that's just because you're an expert in it I have the same thing sometimes um sometimes I feel like oh I'm not professional enough in the way I write so I should charge less but no because my like way of explaining is what makes me special mm. and that's what I should charge more for I don't sound like a banker robot love it so um, yeah and you're you are always worth more than you think especially unless you're a raging narcissist I think if if you're a, a woman watching this who's been an employee in the corporate world for a really long time I think it's almost definite that you're worth a lot more than you think mm. and I know you only asked me for one piece of advice but yeah, I was just fine. like you have to deal with quite stressful people when you freelance and um I just add like a little charge on top like so whatever I charge I add add, like (laughs) I call it the well I won't tell you what I call it in case any clients (laughs) watch but I add a little charge on the top um and that's for your stress because you're going to shorten your life a little bit with stress when you freelance because people are difficult so just add just add like hundred dollars or something on top and that's for your mental health so when they're horrible to you, you just think that's what the hundred dollars is for, you know? <laughs> that reminds me of what, what we do with our kids. If they ask us to get us a snack or open something or like, um, we'll, we'll take a bite or a drink. We'll go, that's a mommy tax. <laughs> so yeah. We're just going to add yeah, a mommy exactly. tax onto the services. And that's, yeah. uh, yeah. 
and enjoy like if they're unreasonable enjoy it think you've earned this you've paid for this and it helps you just take that control I love that that's my advice <laughs> that's excellent um my advice would be um how I get most of my first-time clients that are moving into creating a revenue stream for themselves and building the confidence and seeing that they, they can get that conversion is Again, I tell them to go gift 10 sessions, but put the value on that session and issue a discount code for the first 10. So that when I come, let's say I get Hannah 30 minutes to talk about email strategy. I see that it's 150 or $250, but Hannah is giving me a discount code. So I'm coming in there knowing the value of her time instead of seeing free, first of all, but I am like also understanding that Hannah's starting and, and looking to see if she can help me. So I'm like really excited to use that offer because I see the $250, I get this discount, it goes down to zero. I'm showing up prepared as if it's 250. So it's very different than I'm coming in at a free session because I might not show up. You know, you can get that mm-hmm. sure if it's not seen as valuable. Um, and then have an offer ready I, that I say is about a thousand five hundred to a thousand dollars for something that is um, that yeah if you boundary it in a way that allows you to test your ability in that thirty minutes to drive value. So if I was to book Hannah for a thirty minute email strategy session because you went on LinkedIn, any small business owner that does not have a newsletter needs a newsletter, but I know how much you struggle with the newsletter. Why don't you book me for a thirty minute call and I will structure you a newsletter by the time we're done thirty minutes. This is normally two fifty. I'm giving the first ten for free for anyone who wants. Okay, so I'm coming in there, right? You've just spoken to me. Fuck, I don't have a newsletter. Fuck, I should, if I could get it 30 minutes. Sorry, I don't know if I we could. That's okay. Fun. That's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, I, I would be so valuable for me to sit down with someone if I could walk away with a structure and have that validation. So I'm coming in there like excited to get value. You're going to be able to express your expertise to me, and then you're going to have an offer right after that. That's 500 to a thousand, or you put it a thousand and you negotiate with the client and be like great. We've helped you with this email structure. I can help you write your first 10 newsletters until you get super comfortable. And then you can take it on. Um, I charge a thousand dollars to the, for this. And if they, you hold that and depending on their response, they're either like, yeah, great. Um, or let me think about it. They have their, their newsletter. You've provided value. There's a, there's a chance for them to come back. Or if they express, you know, I just can't do that. Great. Well, how about today? Because you're um, just starting, you're raising your cash tight, you're, um, maybe you have like, I offer female founders that are young, uh, 50% discount. Cause I like was once a female founder that couldn't afford. Um, so you have that in your pocket, you have a discount code in your pocket. Cause your goal is to work with that client. And I just push my first time users to gift 10 and sell 10. And that's all I want them to do to feel comfortable articulating their value and making the, the clothes. I find so many females offer the value, but they're not strong in their clothes. And I was like this when I was raising money, someone would be like, I'm interested in investing. I'd be like, okay, cool. And then I just let it sit instead of being like, how much by when? And I was scared to say that. And now I'm not because I had coaching um, <laughs> and I understand, but I think when people step into generating their own revenue on their own terms, they really just need the reps. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Get out there. What And what is the easiest? I love Hannah. Your, um, what is the easiest to, if, if you can, like, I can sit down with someone for 30 minutes and hundred percent come up with an offer for them, no matter who they are. I've, I know I can do that. So that's what I'm going to gift because I know that I'll be able to offer something of value. And I know that if they want that, they will struggle doing that themselves. If we come up with it and can offer the service for a thousand bucks <clears throat> or lower to, to allow them to materialize it. And again, all those case studies and the people that are attracted to that will inform you. Again, you go through another process at the end of those transactions to tighten up that offer and be like, Oh, this is who's attracted to me. Like I was so interested to see all the 60 people that booked me for a coffee. Cause I could draw some commonalities, super curious people, lifelong learners, people that travel the world. Those are the people that are interested in doing those things. So then I'd get even craftier in my messaging and tighten it, tighten it, tighten it. So yeah, gift something that's the easiest for you ever, but don't put the free, put a price and issue gift discount code so they show up. Two, have a $500 to $1,000 offer right after to allow them to step into that if they want you to do it. Do that, step away, reflect, come back, reiterate. 
I love that. And I, actually, it's funny because I'm doing something similar um, as I've been refining my coaching services. Um, I've actually offered to some, I had a beta price for some people, which was much more discounted rate than it is at full price. But then I've also, I've got a couple of my contractors where I've said, look, we've done some coaching in the past. Would you like to get monthly coaching? I'm happy to just do an hour for hour. I'll tell like, this is my rate. This is what I would charge. Mm -hmm. You tell me how many hours of your work I get for that amount of money. And so like they tell, they set their hourly rate. I set my hourly rate. And so whatever they do for me, I pay back in the value of my coaching services. And, and then it's like a really nice, it helps us because maybe cash flow. we want to invest more in each other, but we don't have the cash flow. but at least we're, and we're building that experience. So I think that's excellent advice, Maxine. Mm. And I'm going to just leave with one of my, um, <laughs> apparently this is one of my catchphrases, my coaching clients have told me, which is, you know, that movie, you know, Mulan, the old Disney, Disney movie, you know, the song, I Be love Man. Man. <laughs> I'm <laughs> always telling, because most of my clients are, uh, socialize as women they identify as women and I generally find like um like studies have shown if you've been socialized as a woman like I think they said that this study I could be misquoting but like um people who've been socialized as women tend to only apply for jobs that they're overqualified for whereas people who've been socialized as men will apply Mm -hmm. for the job they want regardless of their level of qualifications and I tell that to my clients in terms of like promoting themselves selling and I said look you're probably overqualified you've been socialized as a woman you're Mm -hmm. probably more than qualified so be a man think like a man (laughs) and and pretend that you're like sell the business like sell what you want charge what you want um because yeah like if you chances are you're more than qualified enough so that was my little is is (laughs) and you'd be surprised like people don't argue with you you know if you it's it's so easy to offer a discount, but it's so hard to increase your prices. Yes. So start high and okay. you can always like, they're mm-hmm. never going to say, they're never just going to cut off the call and walk away. They're always going to be like, oh, can we work with that and bring it down? Yeah. So I would just always say, especially to women, make sure that you, whatever you think you're worth, you are worth more. Just yeah. like push it higher and things like um, being good at social media. That's so valuable. You don't mm-hmm. realize it, but it is. So just double it whatever you were going to do just double it it and let them be the one to bring you down don't you be the one who brings you down and yeah don't be afraid to ask because when someone pays you a price that you think is outrageous you know you're you're oh my gosh I can't believe people are paying me I I still get that sometimes when I'm like oh my gosh I can't believe someone just spent like paid 250 dollars spent an hour with me like Mm -hmm. that breaks my mind sometimes (laughs) um and it but but it makes you like it's, it makes you show up even better because you're like, yeah, I'm going to earn this, you know, and I want to. Yeah. You know, and have so. fun. Yeah. What comes easy. I just hosted a retreat this weekend for eight women and just brought eight entrepreneurs together for three nights. And it was like the easiest effort and the the most vibe. And it was the, the cash, like, again, the revenue that came in. I was like, no way that I got paid to like bring women to a cabin and just like brainstorm you know, and I was like, this is easy. So don't, yeah, don't confine yourself also to thinking just um, what the industry is doing and needs. Think about what the industry, like, yeah, not what it is currently doing, but what it also needs to innovate. And I was like, not enough women are getting together in a physical space and brainstorming for three days because I think the value that comes out is big. So I'm going to create another offer outside of my regular packages and test it. Um, you mm-hmm. know, so play too. Yeah. Play like, around. Play I love around. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for just such an amazing episode. Um, before we leave, um, if you'd like to just let everyone know where they can find you and get in touch if they're, they listen to this and now they're desperate to get into your world. Um, mm-hmm. Maxine, why don't we start with you? Where can people find you, get in touch with you? I mean, obviously pick my brain. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite way. Yeah. Go to pick my brain search Maxine. Um, anybody can book me for a 30 minute call anytime forever. Um, I will always offer those. They bring just the most remarkable people. I'm always open to talk. Um, and then my favorite platforms are LinkedIn and Instagram at the moment. So yep. Just follow if you want to find out the journey of, or learn more about how others on our platform are packaging and pricing and selling their knowledge and the results of that. Um, those two ways. Yeah. I'll leave links in the show notes for that. Um, cool. And Hannah? Um, me, I like LinkedIn. I know that's not like super cool to say, especially at parties. <laughs> I like LinkedIn. 
Um, you can find me, um, Hannah Duncan. There's loads of Hannah Duncan, but the one uh, with my face. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, like connect with me if you're a freelance writer. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear about how you're doing. Just get in touch. If you if there's anything you think I could help you with, like yeah, just let me know. Um, and then I also have a blog. It's not that active, like maybe one mm. blog a month. But you know, feel free. It's called Hannah's Blog. Um, if you go on Google and type Hannah's Blog and click the first one, then that would be great for my SEO. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, that's it, really. That's amazing. And I bet you anything, by the time this episode airs, because we're recording it in advance, I bet you're going to have a Pick My Brain profile by the time this episode airs. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, okay, that yes, book a session. I want to yeah. package your brain. I want to, I want to. You're totally, I'm, I'm sure you are. Um, so I'll leave the links to everybody. Um, everybody's contact details in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for joining me and for sharing your big, beautiful brains. And thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. It's been a great episode. This is the last episode of the year. So I will see you in 2024. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Showing Up Solo. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review or sharing your thoughts in the comments. These simple gestures help us appease the algorithm gods and continue to bring you great, free education. Ready to navigate the world of marketing with confidence? Take the Marketing Compass Quiz, available at showingupsolo.com, to discover the next phase of your journey. And don't forget to explore our range of courses and coaching programs while you're there. Let's transform your solo venture into a thriving success story, together. Until the next episode, Keep showing up and making your mark in the world of solopreneurship. See you soon.